Ikhwan al-Muslimun should first return to the Qur'an to recognize that Egypt is not one ummah. No, it is not. At the very first page of the book of, his, of Egypt are the Jews, are the Christians. And these Christians in Egypt, according to Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, are our kit and kin for Ummul Mu'minun. Ummul Mu'minun. The mother of the believers came from them. From one, from their midst is one of the mothers of the believers. And so be kind to them, said Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. So you are not one ummah in Egypt. What is the function of a constitution? When we turn to the constitutional sunnah, we get the answer. A constitution is needed when you have different people who want to come to live together. Then you need a constitution. If you have only one homogeneous people, one homogeneous people who have a law of their own, you do not need a constitution. Their law is sufficient for them. It is when you have different people who want to live together as an ummah, a community, only then do you need a constitution. Forget what comes from Oxford and Cambridge and Sorbonne. Listen to the Sunnah. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam recognized the diversity of the population of Medina. He recognized that there were different Jewish tribes. Some of them at war with each other. There were different pagan Arab tribes. And then there were those who had become Muslim. And then there were the Muhajirun from Mecca. And when he arrived in Medina, guess what he did? Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam spent about seven months in patient negotiation. Not in a constitutional conference on the stage of history with debates going on in public. That's not wise. <laughs> no. He entered into private discussions with each of the different tribes each of the different groups and negotiated a consensus. You cannot have a constitution without consensus. Ikhwan, constitutions are not established with referendums. You do not establish a constitution with an election. What nonsense! In order for a constitution to be established, you must have consensus. The Christians walked out of the constitution discussions in Egypt, and you still went ahead with it. Have you forgotten the sunnah? Have you forgotten the sunnah? Is this the example you are setting for the rest of the world of Islam? There are voices around the world today cautioning you for your recklessness. We hope and pray you will not be offended by our words. That you will still consider us to be your brothers. And that you will heed our advice and warning. We apologize to the Christians of Egypt. Yes, we apologize to you. Because this is an embarrassment for us. This is not the way. This is reckless and this is misguided. It was after seven months 
of patient negotiations. The Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam finally succeeded in forging a consensus of that on which there was agreement, minimum agreement amongst all the units of the state, people who constituted a polity who wanted to live together. And thus came the first written constitution in the world, the Mithak of Medina. Is it that you have forgotten that Mithak? How it was established? Had I been Egyptian, had I been an Egyptian, I would never vote in the referendum. Never. And I urge all those in Egypt who are in agreement with my views, no, we will never vote in any referendum for Sharia because that's a departure from the wise and enlightened Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Rather, you have to engage in patient negotiations with wisdom. Something in short supply today, isn't it? With wisdom to try to bring about a consensus. And that consensus will give you your constitution. The Zionists will never want you, never want you to, do, to succeed in that effort. One more statement on Sharia. I said that I am also one of those, like many, many in Egypt, who believe that the enforcement of Sharia today, given the abject failure of our ulama, can lead us to great difficulties and embarrassments. And we want to see the Sharia enforced only on those who accept the Sharia. And that the enforcement of the sheer Sharia should lead to the emergence of an enlightened ulama who will be able to respond to the fitna, the unprecedented fitna of this age with enlightening, enlightened legal thinking, something in short supply amongst those who say that bank interest is not riba, <laughs> that the paper money that we're using and the plastic and electronic money that we're using is halal, and that the modern state the modern Republican state which recognizes state sovereignty to replace Allah as Al-Malik is halal. Short supply of wisdom. What we want to say about the Sharia is this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked us to call, call people to the way of Allah with wisdom. Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah wal mawizatil hasana. Is this wisdom? Is this the way <laughs> to impress upon the Egyptian people that you are rushing through a constitution and a referendum within a short span of time? Is this wisdom? No, it's not. Well then what is wisdom? Let me tell you what is wisdom. Wisdom is that you will enforce the Sharia as a parallel system of law in Egypt alongside whatever rival systems of law there may be. But you have to demonstrate the superiority of the Sharia over all rival systems of law. No, you do not stamp out the others. Let the civil law continue. Let other systems of law that other people may choose continue to operate. And you have to demonstrate with your enforcement of the Sharia that you have a superior system of law which can outshine every rival. You can't do that. 
unless you produce the scholars of law. And law does not exist in a vacuum. No. The scholar of law must also know politics and economics and monetary economics and history and the movement of history in order for him to be able to understand the complexities of today's legal system, legal challenges. And so my word of advice is that instead of enforcing the Sharia upon a people who do not want it or who are worried about how it will be applied, do it a different way. Attract them to the Sharia by operating the Sharia in such a way that it will, it will display its evident superiority over all rivals. One last word, Ikhwan. One last word. What direction, what destination are you taking Egypt to? And what destination is the world heading to? We said that Egypt, that Israel is about to replace the United States as the next ruling state in the world. That's not by accident. That is the Jal in a day which is like a week. And when a day like a week has come to the end, the malhama has already occurred. And the conquest of Constantinople has already occurred, which is after the malhama, not the one that occurred 600 years ago. Then the jal is going to appear. The khuruj of the jal is going to take place. And he will then appear in human form. And he's going to stand up he may come from Khorasan, but he's going to stand up in Jerusalem and declare, I am Al-Masih. But the Jews will not accept him as Al-Masih until he rules over a holy land which encompasses the biblical frontiers of the holy land. And you know that every Egyptian knows that. They changed the Torah. And they brought into the Torah that the Holy Land of Abdul Muqaddasa extends from the river of Egypt, the river Nile, to the river Euphrates. Why did they do that? Because Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam came to Egypt. And then he brought Nabi Yaqub alayhi salam and the whole of Banu Israel into Egypt. And they lived in the eastern delta between the river Nile and the Red Sea. And so they came to the conclusion that this also is a part of the Holy Land, Al-Abdul Muqaddasa. But they are wrong. They are wrong. They wrote it with their own hands. That's not the Holy Land. And so, you don't need a PhD to understand. Because those who have the Qibla in Washington will never accept what I say. You don't need a PhD to understand that the Arab Spring was meant to prepare the way for the Arab slaughter. that they are preparing great wars against the Arabs. Because in order for Israel to become the ruling state in the world, Israel has to impose a political and economic dominion over the Arabs. Number two, Israel cannot impose a political and economic dominion over the Arabs unless and until Israel wages great wars. And these are not only military wars, these are also biological wars. And su succeeds in substantially reducing the population of the Arab world. But Israel has to do something more. 
Israel has to expand her territory to encompass the eastern delta of Egypt. She can't do that with an aerial war or a naval war. She has to have a ground invasion. And so the plan is to attack Egypt from the east with ground troops. And when Israel attacks from the east, the NATO will attack from the west, from Libya. And those fools, and that's what they deserve to be called, fools. They were fools in Libya, and they're just as foolish in Syria today. Those fools who, who made an alliance with NATO, NATO being the military arm of the Zionist Judeo-Christian alliance. Those fools who made an alliance with NATO to overthrow the Libyan government have now given to NATO the opportunity to be present in Libya. And so NATO will attack from the west and Israel from the east. And there will be a naval blockade from the north. And you have southern Sudan also, which is an ally of Israel today, from the south. And so they'll attack Egypt from east, west, north and south, from above and even from below. Because they now have the power to make earthquakes. That war on Egypt is coming. And they need a justification for war. They need a causus bellum for war. They don't want to attack Egypt and appear to be aggressors. So what do they do? What do they do to prepare the way for war on Egypt? Is Ikhwan aware of this? At the moment when Egypt should be coming together. All the different forces in Egypt should be uniting to resist the greatest threat that has ever existed in Egyptian history. The Zionist threat of an attack on Egypt. At this moment when we should be uniting our people, Ikhwan's government in Egypt has succeeded and succeeded dramatically in dividing the people as they were never divided before. Is that wisdom? Is that the destination that you take in Egypt to? Who is smiling today with what is happening in Egypt? The answer, the Zionists are smiling. That's the answer. They want to be able to set up Egypt for the attack on Egypt that they'll make it possible through the Arab Spring for a so-called Islamic government to come into Egypt. And then they'll help that Islamic government to take control of the military. And then they'll help that Islamic government to take control of the judiciary. So that the Islamic government is in total control of Egypt. And when the Islamic government is in total control of Egypt, and the Sharia is enforced on Egypt, and civil war comes to Egypt, they'll smile. And then they will exploit the weakness of the ulama to make the Sharia look stupid, to make the Sharia look foolish, to make the Sharia look savage and, and backward. And there are many ways that they can do that because of the failure of the ulama today. And then they will be able to show to the world, this is what Islam is doing in Egypt. And these people are bloodthirsty people and they only want to cut the throat of Israel in order to be able to attack Egypt and yet not be blamed for committing aggression. Is Ikhwan going to take Egypt to that destination? Knowing that that's the, de the destination to which the world is now moving, what should we do, O oh, Egypt, at this moment? After the colossal failure of their advisors to the present Egyptian government, they should be removed. And men of greater wisdom should take over. 
Number two, no constitution should be enforced upon the people unless and until it is arrived at through consensus. The Christians in Egypt have an equal political right to the Muslims to a constitution to which they will agree. Number three, that the Sharia should be enforced only on those who are willing to submit to the Sharia. So it will not be the law of all Egypt. No. The other systems of law will function alongside the Sharia. Number four, that when the Sharia is enforced, we should not we should not so enforce the Sharia that we look like fools. Rather, Islamic scholarship must rise to the occasion. Islamic scholarship must rise to the occasion to operate the Sharia in such a way that it demonstrates its evident superiority over all rival systems of law. That's not easy. That is not easy. That requires the best Islamic scholarship in the world today. And also it requires that Islamic scholarship must expand its vision beyond law to encompass all other subjects that are relevant, including the one in which I specialize, al muakhir zaman I pray that these words of mine may not offend, may not hurt. I pray that these words of mine may be accepted in the spirit in which I am given them. Yes, I have used harsh language to condemn reckless and misguided behavior because the moment is now too dangerous. I pray that Egypt may step back from this pit of fire on which it now stands. The reason may prevail, good sense may prevail and that the constitution may be established on the basis of consensus and that the sharia be enforced only on those who are willing to submit to the sharia. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.